Let's begin today's lesson. We'll work on simplifying fractions. That's easy. The numerator and denominator both have 4 and 5, so we can cancel them. Then 1, 2, and 3 remain, so the answer is 6. Wait a second, Zundaman. Here comes the next problem. What? Whoa, what? What is this? Is this a fraction? Oh, this one looks easy too. Wait, something feels strange. There's nothing strange about it. 3 is in both the numerator and denominator, so we can cancel it. And 4 is also in both, so we can cancel that too. If we keep doing this forever, only 1 and 2 remain. So the answer is 2. This has turned into a serious problem. Huh? What do you mean? If you look closely, this expression has the form infinity over infinity. Infinity over infinity. Yeah, I guess you're right. Both numerator and denominator become infinite if we calculate them separately. Is that a bad thing? Yeah, it's not good. You can't treat infinity like a number in calculations. So, we can't simplify this fraction. Yeah, but still, that's kind of hard to accept. Don't worry, we can still give this kind of expression some interpretation. Oh, that's a relief. First, let's look at a simpler example where the denominator starts from 2. This one also has the form infinity over infinity. Let's rewrite this expression so we can calculate it. We first take out the 1 as it is, and then take out 2 over 2. Then take out 3 over 3. If we keep doing this infinitely, each fraction is finite and all of them equal 1. The product of all these infinitely many numbers is 1. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess so. But this isn't the only possible interpretation. For example, we could first take out 1 over 2, and then take out 2 over 3. If we keep doing that infinitely, the result is not equal to 1. What? No way! That can't be right. First, the 2's cancel. Then the 3's cancel. If we keep repeating this forever, only the numerator's 1 should remain. I understand why you think that. Actually, up until now, we've been dealing with what's called an infinite product in a naive way. But now, we need to think more carefully about what an infinite product really means. Alright, please explain. Let's consider a certain sequence here. First, let's set the value of a sub 1 to 1 half. Then we multiply it by 2 thirds, and call that value a sub 2. Hmm, I see. We can cancel the 2's, so a sub 2 becomes 1 third. Exactly. Next, multiply this by 3 fourths. We'll call that value a sub 3. This time we can cancel the 2's and 3's, so the answer is 1 fourth. Huh? Wait a second. a sub 1 is 1 half. a sub 2 is 1 third. a sub 3 is 1 fourth. So, the values are getting smaller and smaller? Good observation. Now, let's express the limit of this sequence like this. We can write a sub infinity as an infinite product, but remember, it's really just the limit of this sequence. As we go further, the denominator increases by 1 each time. That means the value can get arbitrarily close to 0. Therefore, the limit is 0. That's kind of mysterious. At first glance, it looks like everything except 1 can be cancelled, so only 1 should remain. But, I understand how you feel. But if we look again, even after simplification, a sub 2 still has a 3 left. And in a sub 3, there's still a 4 left after simplification. In other words, the cancellation is being postponed here. Now that you mention it, that makes sense. And the same logic applies if the denominator starts from another number. For example, let's consider the case where the denominator starts from 3. Here too, we can see that as the sequence goes on, the denominator keeps increasing. Therefore, the limit of this sequence is also zero. It's still strange though. It feels like everything except 1 and 2 could be cancelled. So only 1 and 2 should remain, but... When multiplication goes on infinitely, it hides the fact that the cancellation keeps getting postponed. So, we must be careful when dealing with infinite products. Or we could say, we must be careful with infinite cancellation. I've definitely learned my lesson. Really? Up to now, we've treated infinite cancellation as something bad. But actually, that idea is very important in mathematics. What do you mean? Now, knowing that it's not rigorous, let's unleash the power of infinite cancellation. I wonder what will happen. To show that it's not rigorous, 
I put a question mark in the upper right corner. That's a unique touch. Wait. Both the numerator and denominator go to infinity just like before. Exactly. That's what it means. If we assume infinite cancellation is possible, everything from 4 onward cancels out, leaving only 1, 2, and 3. That means the answer is 3 factorial. That's such a cool calculation. Then let's generalize this result. If we let a be a natural number, what value would this expression take? Of course, this isn't a rigorous calculation. Leave it to me. If a is a natural number, then somewhere in the numerator there will be an a. So the numerator can be written like this. Then, after canceling everything from a onward, we're left with 1 through a minus 1. Therefore, the answer is a minus 1 factorial. That's a beautiful result. So we found that a minus 1 factorial can be represented this way. In short, everything from a onward cancels out. We've been ignoring rigor so far, but let's take it one step further. I wonder what's ahead. So far we've assumed that a is a natural number, because factorials are defined only for non-negative integers. But if you look at the right hand side, formally, it seems we can extend a. That means we might be able to extend the definition of the factorial. What do you mean? For example, if we substitute a equals pi, we get an expression corresponding to pi minus 1 factorial. Pi minus 1 factorial? I've never heard of that. Of course, this is just a formal expression. It's basically just a symbolic fraction-like form. And unlike the four, we can't even perform formal cancellation here. Because the numbers in the numerator and denominator are all different. It looks like it might have meaning at first glance, but something feels off. How could we give this expression a proper meaning? It's worth thinking about. The truth is, both the numerator and denominator diverge to infinity, so this fraction doesn't have meaning in the usual sense. So let's start by expressing it as a finite product. It'll look something like this. Ah, the difference from before is that both the numerator and denominator now stop at n. Exactly, that's the key point. By the way, the denominator multiplies all integers from a to n, so note that the following inequality holds between a and n. Now, up to a certain point, we can proceed just like before. Yeah, that makes sense. If a is a natural number, then somewhere in the numerator there's an a. So the numerator can be written like this. Then, after canceling everything from a onward, 1 through a minus 1 remain. Therefore, the answer is a minus 1 factorial. Huh? That's exactly the same result as before. Yes. But from here things change drastically. Really? If we summarize the result so far, it looks like this. a minus 1 factorial can be expressed by this kind of fraction. Again, that means everything after a cancels out. But take a closer look. First, the numerator contains the numbers from 1 to n. So there are n factors. Here, n is a natural number. If n weren't a natural number, the phrase n factors wouldn't even make sense. Well, that's kind of obvious. Meanwhile, the denominator has the numbers from a to n. That means there are n minus a plus 1 factors. Since n is a natural number, a must also be a natural number. Because n minus a plus 1 has to be a natural number too. Hmm, I'm not sure I got that. Let's go through an example. We take out just the denominator part. It looks like this. Now let's try forcing a non-integer value into a. For example, what happens if a equals 0.5 and n equals 8? Hold on a sec. Since a equals 0.5, it starts at 0.5, then increases by 1 each time, and ends at 8. Wait, something feels off. It doesn't seem like it'll ever actually reach 8. Looks like you figured it out. Yes, we start with 0.5 and keep adding 1. So every factor ends up having a 0.5 attached. That means we'll never actually reach 8. So this expression doesn't make sense. Ah, so that's why a can't be extended to real numbers. Then what should we do? Don't worry, there's a solution. That's our meaning. So far we've expressed a minus 1 factorial using this fraction, but we found that we can't extend a in the denominator to real numbers. So let's try this instead. 
Whoa, that's quite an intense looking fraction. Uh, it looks like we multiply both numerator and denominator by the same expression. So in the numerator, we first multiply from 1 to n, then by 1 plus n, 2 plus n, and so on, up to a plus n. And in the denominator, we also multiply up to n, and then continue up to a plus n as well. Exactly. That means the denominator is a product from a to a plus n. There are n plus 1 factors here, so we can extend a to real numbers. Because even if we extend a to real numbers, the denominator is still a product of n plus 1 numbers, which we can calculate. Oh, you're right. It kind of feels like a trick, but okay, problem solved. Not so fast. What? Let's look at the numerator next. Here we're multiplying numbers from 1 up to a plus n, so it's a product of a plus n numbers. That means a plus n must be a natural number. So we can't extend a to real numbers after all. So it really doesn't work after all. When we fix the denominator, now the numerator gives us trouble. What should we do then? Let's break the problem apart for now, and rewind our calculation a bit. First, the denominator can stay as the product of natural numbers from a to a plus n, like before. No matter what value a takes, this is still a product of n plus 1 numbers, so extending a to real numbers should be fine. Okay, let's split the numerator into two parts. First, the product from 1 to n, since it doesn't depend on a, there's no issue here. Hmm, I see what you mean. Then what remains is the product from 1 plus n to a plus n. This product has a factors. There are a factors, so a has to be a natural number. So we still can't extend a to real numbers. Sundaman, watch out! A hint is coming! What? Whoa, what is this? That's quite a bold hint. Is it? I don't even understand what the hint is saying. Let me explain. On the left we have the problematic expression from before. It has a factors from 1 plus n to a plus n. As it is, we can't extend a. But if we fix a, and that n grow larger and larger, the numbers from 1 to a become negligible compared to n. So this can be seen as multiplying n by itself, a times. That means it can be approximated by n to the power of a. That's a bold way of thinking. Have you noticed something important here? Something important? On the left, a cannot be extended to real numbers, because saying a factors only makes sense when a is a natural number. But the right-hand side has no such restriction, so here we can extend a to real numbers. You got me! Yes, indeed. But that's a very intuitive explanation. We can write it a bit more precisely. Let's consider a fraction, where the one expression is the numerator, and the other is the denominator. We want to show that this fraction approaches 1 as n tends to infinity. Then, for large n, we can say the numerator and denominator are almost equal. Now, how can we show that? Hmm, let's see. We can break down the numerator. Then we can divide each factor by n. Since n over n equals 1, we can rewrite the first term like this. And we can do the same to the other terms. Finally, as n tends to infinity, the fractions with n in the denominator approach 0. So the whole expression converges to 1. Now we've shown that the original fraction converges to 1. We're ready, let's put everything together. This is getting cool! First, we found that a minus 1 factorial can be expressed as a finite product fraction. But this alone doesn't let us extend a to real numbers. So, instead of multiplying up to n, we multiply up to a plus n. And that allows a to be extended to real numbers in this part. And what's left is this. Got it! Since this expression doesn't depend on n, taking the limit as n approaches infinity doesn't change its value. Now, let's keep the denominator as is. The product from 1 to n in the numerator is just n factorial. And the remaining part was approximated by n to the power of a for large n. Since we're taking the limit as n approaches infinity, we can treat this as an equality, not an approximation. Wow, that's such a cool formula. By the way, I skipped a small detail earlier. Huh? You did? Actually, it's better to explicitly bring out n to the power of a here. 
That way, since this fraction converges to 1, we can ignore it when taking the limit. Thus, n to the power of a remains. Oh, I see how that works. Anyway, we've reached our goal. We prove this equation. a minus 1 factorial can be expressed through a mysterious limit. And on the right-hand side of this equation, we can extend the natural number a to a real number x. That gives us this expression. It's been quite a journey. Actually, this is the famous gamma function. What? You knew that? Yes, the gamma function is known as the natural extension of the factorial. In fact, if m is a natural number, gamma m equals m minus 1 factorial, so note that it's shifted by 1. Also, when x is 0 or a negative integer, the denominator becomes 0, so those values are excluded from the domain. And for all real x except those, this limit is known to converge. Wow, I didn't know that. But wait, wasn't the gamma function defined using an integral? You remember that. Well, it's come up a few times on this channel. Indeed, that integral is the most well-known definition of the gamma function. Actually, there are several different ways to define the gamma function, and they all give the same values. However, the integral definition only works for positive x, while the limit-based definition covers a much wider range. Oh, so the domains are different! Also, the gamma function can be extended from real to complex numbers. When that happens, the condition x is positive becomes the real card of x is positive in the integral definition. On the other hand, this condition doesn't change in the limit definition. It's known that this limit converges for all complex numbers except zero and negative integers. That's such a wide domain! By the way, here's what the real gamma function looks like. That's a strange looking curve. We know that zero and negative integers are excluded from the domain of the gamma function. And you can see that in this graph. Yes, it diverges at those points. One last thing, please note that this approach isn't historically related to the actual discovery of the gamma function. Thanks for watching! If you'd like to support this channel, consider becoming a member. In this video, we talk about the purpose of our membership. Check it out if you're interested. Well then, take care everyone. See you later.